started to go down the stairs. I mean, it was like somebody was kidnapping my children in front of my face. And they said, you come down. The police were at the bottom of the stairs. They said, don't come down or we'll arrest you. And, you know, uh, they were the bodyguards, I guess, for these people from child welfare. And, um, and that I was, I can't even, even today, I mean, I, I think I, you know, I think I'm cried out right now, but even today I can't even describe how finished I felt, how my life was over. Um, I had absolutely no reason to live. Now you can't get clean for your kids, um, but my kids were keeping me level. Um, and now I had like no, no reason. And not only that, I was devastated. Um, my children were gone and I thought I would never see them again because I thought, you know, I didn't know anything about the system. I thought when they took your kids, you, they, you never got them back. And, and that was it. I just said, uh, to the baby's father, get me drugs, get me drugs now. Um, cause I, it was either that or I was really, I mean, I was thinking of throwing myself out the window. I really... I had tried to commit suicide before, but this was the the strongest urge I ever had. And he was afraid for me, so he pulled me down the stairs, made me come out with him. And we went back to the house. We got some drugs. We went back to the house, and we couldn't sit there because we saw the children and, like they were ghosts. We heard them laughing, and we smelled them in the furniture. And, and it was just... We couldn't stay there. We just walked out and we never went back. We left everything we owned, our clothes, our ID. We didn't care, we just never went back. And, and we wound up uh, staying with here and there with other people, of course, that use drugs because who else would put up with us? And one day we didn't have any money and the guy that we were staying with said, look, uh, you know, what's in this for me? I, you know, you gotta get me some drugs. And went, How? And he was like, well, there's this, a stroll two blocks away and I was like, What's a stroll? And he's like, oh, come on. You know what a stroll is? And I was like, no, I don't. He goes, it's where the prostitutes, you know, they walk. They stroll. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. And a couple days, though, I did it. And um, I was scared to death. And it was a day when the pimp had his girls out. The, the first pimp I ever... I knew by name. <laughs> um, uh, I actually knew a pimp, and all of a sudden, um, Bobby. And uh, his girls were all in, you know, the negligee with the with the uh, the thigh high stockings and the heels, and you know, and I was in jeans and a t-shirt. But I got picked up, um, <laughs> and I hated it. I hated every second of it. I never did like it, and I can't imagine. I know the the happy hooker and all that, but I don't. Uh, I have a really hard time believing. Yeah, I, you know, I really have a hard time believing any woman likes prostitution. It made it, it made it worse for me. It made me feel even worse about myself. And that, so, and I would get high to forget what I did, and then do what I did to get high. And it, it really, it, it was a terrible cycle. And I had to support the baby's father's uh, addiction now too. And it was just too much. And one day, because I had to give some to the person whose house we lived in, I had to give some to the baby's father and then I had to support my abbot. And I was exhausted, I was exhausted. And one day I said to the baby's father, look, uh, you've got a place to go. You've got a family that cares about you. Um, go to them, because I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, and, and, and I didn't think about going to a program. I thought I, my life was over and I was just going to die in the street. It didn't take long for me to feel that way. It was only a few months before I felt like, okay, I'm going to die out here. Um, and I became what they call an outlaw, a prostitute that doesn't have a pimp. So I had absolutely no protection. And um, the guys that beat me never looked like guys that would beat you, you know. Um, and they were all white, and they were all, and by the way, when I was in Miami Beach, and most of the time in the beginning of New York, everybody I used with was white. Um, there were no black people in Miami Beach at that time anyway, but, um, but you don't see that on the news. You still don't see it. If I went, went out to get high today, I would still be getting high with a bunch of Caucasian people. Um, it's absolutely like nothing you see on TV. White people get high all the time, <laughs> just like as often as anybody else. Um, 
and the majority of cocaine dealers in the country are white males between the ages of 18 and 45. But you don't see that on TV. Cops is always about, you know, cops arresting black people. So that's ridiculous. Um, and I didn't get attacked so much by black people. Um, just a few people in the neighborhood I was with because they were addicts and I was a woman alone and they wanted drugs. But I learned how to get around that by offering them drugs before they beat me up and asking them to do me a favor. Like, oh, will you, will you watch out, for my, watch my back for me? Well, they would never really watch my back, but you know, it, it made them feel better about themselves and you know, whatever. Instead of beating me up now, they were, they were like keeping somebody else from beating me up, you know? Uh, I don't know. It was bizarre. It was bizarre learning about the street. But every game that could be played was played on me because I was very naive. Um, but uh, most of the rapes, the beatings, the stabbings, the... It was all from white males and, and middle class, upper class. The guys that I could trust were like the guys that came in their company vehicles because, you know, I could always call their company and get to lose their job. So like the cable guy, the Entenmann's guy, the Daily News guys, you know, they, they was great because their vehicles had, you know, they, we could get in the back and nobody could see them. So it was more comfortable. And, um, and so those guys, you know, and I always got free cake from the Entenmann's guy. And the cable guy was always trying to give me cable remotes. Here, you can sell this. Nobody wanted cable remotes. How many people actually lose their cable remote? You know, he would give me like 10 at a time. I couldn't, I was tr trying to sell them for a dollar a piece at this one place. They were like, we've got a billion of these. And he must have a lot of guys. Um, so, you know, those guys I could trust because they were coming in their work vehicles. But everybody else, to, after a while, I, I didn't know. Because um, even if they gave me the money first, they could beat me up and take it back. So that wasn't enough of a... A thing. I had a police um, who were my customers, but I didn't mind. They came, they paid their money, they, they, got, they did the business and they went away. They didn't hurt me and, and that was okay. Um, I didn't care what you did for a living as long as you, you know, left me alone. Um, and I was probably the worst hooker out there. I, I never pretended to like it and, and I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't let you touch me. You couldn't touch me. You know, just stay over there, keep your hands by your side and I'll do what I have to do. Um, and even a couple of times when I had sex in vehicles, I would like hold the guy like up here so even our chests weren't touching. I, but I still had repeat customers. And the reason was because I didn't, I didn't rob them. I didn't rob them. I didn't have a pimp who came up and held a gun to their head and said, give me your wallet. Uh, they knew what they were getting. And uh, basically, they were just as afraid as me because they probably had some bad experiences themselves. Um, so... Uh, that went on, and the police did such amazingly ridiculous, stupid things in front of me. And I realized today, you know, at the time, I, I just said, I didn't really care. I just didn't want them to arrest me, and I didn't want to get beaten. Um, they, they took bribes in front of me from the pimps. It, it always made me mad. It happened a couple of times where the pimps would hand them money, and they wouldn't arrest the pimps' girls, but they would arrest me. That always, you know, really angered me. I was working in front of an illegal sweatshop, and the police knew it was an illegal sweatshop, but I saw them back there with the owner of the sweatshop, and, you know, the, he was probably giving them money, too. Um, I saw them stop drug dealers, take the money, take the drugs, and let them go. Um, uh, and they did all that in front of me. Also, they, they said stuff like, one time I said, oh, that's it, I quit, I quit. I was in the back of the van, and they said, um, oh, don't quit now, Mary, I need a new VCR. And the next time they came around, actually, Giuliani was in the van, and the police sergeant, or captain, or whoever, was in the van. And they were telling him, them about me, how many times they'd arrested me, and Giuliani said, get rid of her, and they, they drove away. And then uh, the other van came and arrested me, and I said, oh, man, how many VCRs do I have to buy, you guys? And the, ca the sergeant captain, whoever was, another guy, big wig, was in that van, and he, he looked at the whole van, got very quiet. And the police said, oh, we don't get extra money for arresting you. But I had heard them say they get time and a half, plus... Right in the station, there was a, a map of the area I worked in, and you would get time and a half if you busted people in that area. And it was, an, uh, it was a project. It was mostly people of color. I wish I had a, a camera at that time, and I wish uh, I could have recorded that. You know? um, 
And so this probably would have gone on forever. I realized that they did all those things in front of me because they thought I was going to die in the street too. A woman who lives in the street has a two and a half year lifespan. 80% of them get murdered and the other 20% die of exposure or whatever. So I expected that to happen to me too. So that's why they did those things in front of me. They didn't expect this. And, uh, I didn't expect this. I, I didn't expect to accomplish the things I have. I was lucky. The last arrest, they arrested me falsely at least half a dozen times. Uh, I wasn't even on the straw. I was coming home from the grocery store. But there was nothing I could do about it because I had been arrested so many times that, that if I said I was not guilty, oh yeah, right, you know. Um, but the last time they arrested me, I wanted to fight them because um, they pulled up on me again when I wasn't working. and. Uh, it wasn't the prostitution cops, it was the undercovers. And uh, they said, you know, get in the van. And I knew those guys too, because one time they, uh, they arrested me for having a pipe, and another, which is a misdemeanor, thank God, in New York. Uh, in Florida, it's a felony. Uh, they arrested me one time for having the pipe, and another time for I forget. But <laughs> it was, <laughs> and they were the undercover guys. So they, they stopped and they pulled over and I said, what do you want? And they said, you know, get in the, in the car. I said, why? I don't have any drugs. I don't have any paraphernalia. What are you, what are you doing? And they said, well, you sold us drugs. And I went, oh, yeah, right. I sold you drugs. I know you guys. And so I, I, I was crying. I started crying. <laughs> and, and they took me in front of the judge. I told the public defender again who I never met a public defender for more than five minutes but I told this public defender look at my record all these guys have arrested me before how stupid would I be to sell them drugs I know them all by their names well one was called himself Rambo he looked like Mickey Mouse actually but Rambo whatever and uh, they all used undercover names but I knew all their undercover names and I said and you can look right there they were the arresting officers um, of me before so can't we use that as a defense and also can't we use as a defense that I've got what 49 arrests for loitering for the purpose of prostitution and trespassing and suddenly I'm a drug dealer at the end of that I said come on who, who I mean that's who would believe this and he went well Mary if I wanted to defend a and he called me a crackhead uh, against the uh, New York Police Department he said um I wouldn't, I'd have to give that case to someone else. He said, and, and really think about it, you know, if, if you pled not guilty, uh, you would have to go to court. How many court appearances would you show up for? You'd, uh, and where, if you got, if you got pled not guilty, uh, if you got found not guilty, where would you go? And I would go right back where I was. And I'm not saying the police would have killed me because it's not easy to kill someone and hide that. But uh, they were already making my life very hard. They could have made it a lot harder. Uh, they do things to you like keep the cuffs on you longer. They lose your paperwork so you stay in the holding cell for um, three days instead of two. Um, the holding cells are freezing cold, filthy. You have to sleep on the floor. Um, you, there's one toilet with people throwing up and having diarrhea. Um, men are watching you when you're peeing. I mean, you know, it's just a really bad experience. And, the, and you get like a cheese sandwich. Look, that, that, if that was the worst of it, uh, if you have asthma, if you have HIV and you don't have medicine, um, what happens to you in, in these places? And then they took me to Rikers Island, and Rikers Island's another three days of paperwork before you get a bed. So you're going five days without a bed. You're going five days sleeping on a hard floor, um, with no, you know, with, with no blankets because they don't give you a blanket till after you're admitted. Um, and then by then it was, <laughs> it would be like I'd do two days in a in a cell, and I'd. I'd go home. But what's bad about that is I, you know, at the time I smoked cigarettes too. You couldn't get cigarettes. You couldn't get commissary food. Um, so basically you lived on bread and, uh, and something that looked like regurgitated baby food. That the, I mean, really? I mean, come on. I mean, we spend supposedly Rikers Island's the largest prison in the world and it costs more than any other prison in the world. 
so why couldn't they give us food? I mean, real food, you know, just regular food. Sometimes you'd get a hamburger or a chicken thigh, and those were great days. But in general, um, it's, it's almost a form of torture, the food they give you. No books, no, no, nothing to occupy your time. So it's really a breeding ground for violence uh, at b boredom and, uh, uh, boredom and uh, a lack of services really make you crazy. And, and uh, I'm lucky I joined a program that was on Rikers Island called the STEP program because now I had a one year, which is eight months. And so the STEP program would take me. They don't take short term, so, you know. So I went to this program and it wasn't bad. It was in jail, so you're still in jail. You still have to follow all the jail rules and, and uh, you still have all the dangers of jail. But STEP's a little better because they have a, a few more officers and they do give you an education. They start you on with some type of um, self-awareness and some type of yes you can all this lady said to me was I was walking up the hall I wasn't in step yet and this is why I joined I was walking up the hall and one of the guards said to me oh you getting released today Mary and I said yeah and I said oh we'll see you next week <laughs> and and um, the lady heard that and she stopped and she looked at me she said what's your name Mary and I said yeah and she said that guy said he's gonna see you next week I said yeah well I've been here you know you know 50 times almost I said I don't know 45 times something like that and she said you don't have to live this way and I was like yeah. and so when I came back and I got I had the eight months I I looked into joining that program and it helped me it, it started me on the road um, I think the main things that helped me was you, you know if you're an adult in prison you don't get an education but uh, Rikers Island, the women's facility has a separate cell block for um, adolescents. And they get to go to school. So because I was in this special program called STEP, uh, if there were empty seats, we would get to take them. And there almost always were. So um, I went to take my GED test. They give you the test and whatever you fail, they um, tutor you in and you take the test again. But I passed the GED first time out <laughs> with a really high score, um, which, uh, a really high score, um, which surprised me because, well, first of all, I hadn't been in school in over 20 years. I mean, you know, uh, I, uh, but also because mm, I was always told I was stupid for so long. And here I was not having been in school for so many years and passing the GED the first time out with a high score. It helped. I thought, well, maybe I have a chance. Maybe, uh, you know, I didn't fry all my brain cells and I, maybe I'm smarter than I think I am. They cut all the social workers on Rikers Island. There was only <laughs> going to be two social workers left for 2,000 women. So one of the social workers was leaving and she said, can I do anything for you? And there were 50 of us in my, in my uh, cell that, you know, they don't, it's not like you get separate cells when you're in jail. You all sleep in one big room, uh, another breeding ground for all kinds of trouble. Um, and uh, 49 women went running to her and I sat in the corner and uh, I was lucky because it could have worked out any other way and, and she decided to take me as a challenge. <laughs> and she said, ha. Ah. She said, how come you didn't come up to me? And I said, well, there's nothing you can do for me. There's nothing anybody can do for me. And she said, hmm. And she just asked me, do you have children? And I started to cry. Um, and uh, she found their number. And she found their father's number. and. Uh, he hadn't taken away my parental rights or anything, and my parental rights were still good. And but that was, I wasn't even thinking about that at the time. Um, he let me talk to them, and Joseph came to the phone and said, "Oh, mommy, mommy, are you coming home?" And um, the old me, the me that didn't have any education whatsoever about myself and about my disease and about life in general. Um, wanted to hit myself over the head and go, look at you, you're no good. He's been sitting by the phone for two years, over two years waiting for you. Um, but just that little bit of education that I got in that time in jail, and it shouldn't have been in jail. I think I would have learned a lot more outside. Um, but uh, just that little bit of 
education gave me this different, a little bit of different perspective. And instead of hitting myself over the head, I kicked myself in the ass and I, I moved forward. And I said, wow, he wants me in his life. There's a place in his life for me. And um, he still loves me. And, and Nisa, I don't think, remembered me as much as Joseph did, but she still got on the phone and said, hi, hey, Mommy. That's what she said. She said that she doesn't really remember much. From, from that, yeah. She was like one, a little over one, you know. And I guess I'm blessed for that, too. So when I had her back in my life, you know, uh, another thing that happened there is a program came from the outside, and they never had beds available except since they had a waiting list of six months and I was getting out in eight and they knew when I was getting out as long as I didn't get in a fight or something and get my time extended, pardon me for crying again, uh -huh. um, they, uh, they held a bed for me and they came and picked me up because Rikers Island, you go from there, you go the, on the 101 bus, it takes you two blocks from where I worked and two blocks from the projects where you can get any drug you want. So it was like an instant relapse for me every time I got off that bus, because I just would stand, I would get off the bus and there'd be somebody stopping their car, hey, you know? <laughs> and within 10 minutes I'd be getting high and paying for it. Everybody always said that to me, whose houses I went to, they said, you get out of jail and you come here with drugs. Everybody else gets out of jail and says, hey, look, I just got out, can you get me some drugs? You know? <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, I guess that's a good thing. Like when you're in the street, I guess that's a good thing. Um, and this time I went to a program, and it was a long-term program for $64,000 was my last incarceration on Rikers Island, where I, this time I was in the STEP program, so I got my GED. But if I didn't join the STEP program, I wouldn't have gotten my GED, so I would have gotten nothing. On my incarcerations in Rikers Island, I lived in the street in a cardboard box and never got lice. I got lice on Rikers Island. It was so bad that we could see the eggs in our eyelashes. It took six months to get rid of them because they wouldn't, we, you know, you don't have a washing machine. You have to wash your clothes by hand and that wouldn't get rid of the eggs or the lice, I guess. And so we just kept getting it bad. And finally, they changed all our mattresses and they changed our clothes and we got rid of it, but it took six months. Um, uh, I also never got sick in the street. Um, I got chicken pox on Rikers Island. Um, it's a breeding ground for, jail and prison is a breeding ground for disease and violence. Um, and drug use and hooch. Ooh, the worst alcohol on the planet, but people drink that stuff. It was like mop water. You call it um, juice. Yeah, oh, it was awful. You take, oh. you, you take your apples and you take uh, the little juice, little juice things they give you, and some sugar, and for a minute, <laughs> and, then, and then you put it in a plastic bag and you stick it under the radiator. And it oh, really? Yeah, and oh. They get it. You get fucked. I know. I tasted oh, it only once, and I I took one sip and said, "Oh, no, thank you." But I saw people smoking crack. And I remember waiting for, because when I got my eight month, I had to go back to get sentenced. I wasn't sentenced yet. And in the waiting room, one girl had, she had crack. And she didn't have any way to smoke it. Three girls had pipes. Three girls had pipes. There were only six of us in the room, and three of them had pipes. And they all went, commenced to smoke. And I said, no thanks. Because, not because I, I you know, was so, uh, I don't know, I wasn't cured. I just couldn't imagine taking a hit inside a jail cell. And then I'm trying to scratch my way out for more. Just not my thing. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, um, so I went to the program. It cost 64000 my last incarceration, where I got nothing. And... Uh, for $18,000 in this program, I got psychological counseling, I got individual counseling, I got group counseling, I got job skills uh, training. I mean, I have other things to say about treatment, but let me just stick to the good things because it's better than jail. Um, <laughs> it's, it, 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 if you're not mandated, it's a really good idea to go to treatment. Um, it's still terribly military based and it's not if you go to a, a mixed uh, 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 co-educational <laughs> rehab uh, it's not good because there's a lot of yelling and 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 women we just don't respond well to that 
Uh, but I was just tired and I was serious and I didn't let any of that bother me. And plus I had been in treatment before when I was younger and before I even started using drugs because I was an orphan. They didn't know where to put me. <laughs> My mom was like, I'm tired of you. Get out. Um, so I went to this program. I got everything I needed. Um, they, they, uh, when I went for a job interview, they got me a suit to wear. Um, they got me hooked up with a, a job interview place that knew I had a history. Um, but the director was like, you're ready. You, you can go for a job interview. And um, I saw my first computer. <laughs> I touched my first computer when I was in treatment. Uh, poor people, you know, like, if you're poor, you can't afford a computer. I, I was at a, a flat screen TV. My life is really much different today, you know. Um, and then, um, and while I was there, I met this lady named Dr. Zelma Henriquez. She came in to speak to the, when, when you get out of step, there's a graduation. You wear a cap and gown and everything. And uh, she asked me after I was in treatment for a while and I got out, I got a job. I got a, there used to be an ex-offender grant for college. I got the ex-offender grant that they've discontinued that. They've also discontinued the STEP program. There are no programs left for women on Rikers Island except one for mentally ill uh, patients. Uh, and those are the things that help me and they're gone. So I despair. Uh, and, and Mayor Bloomberg says he has no sympathy for prisoners. Um, so that's that. Uh, nice guy. Yeah. And, uh, but treatment, like I said, it gave me a place. And this time now, I really had a lot of education about myself. But the best thing for me was living life on life's terms. For the first time in my life, I had a life. I couldn't go back to my old life. My old life was full of, you know, bad messages and alcoholics. And now I had a life with real people. Uh, real people. <laughs> well, you know, people who didn't have so many problems. And I had a, a, a great experience. Um, and I was so happy. Uh, I started dating on the internet. <laughs> and uh, I met, uh, that's a book. That's another book. Um, but I got in touch with my kids. I saw my kids every weekend. They came and spent the night at my apartment. And I would have, I, it's not like I would have fought for custody, full custody of my kids, because number one, I couldn't afford them. Uh, and, and their family could, but also I just felt like, you know, they had had enough upheaval in their life. So who was I to say, okay, now you're going to have another upheaval and you're going to live with me. I might have though done that if I had money, but uh, the system wants the son to have a room, the daughter to have a room. Who can afford a two bedroom? I, I still don't have a two bedroom house, you know? Um, uh, and so I didn't do that, but I'm glad today that I didn't. It worked out the way it's supposed to. Uh, but I got to see them, they came every weekend. And we, you know, went to the zoo and movies and stuff that you do with your kids. And um, we developed really good relationships. And uh, the older they got, they started meeting me in the middle of the week on their own, as well as on the weekends. And now they're, uh, my son's 20 now. I'm lucky if I see him once a month, you know. <laughs> but that's with everybody's kids. It's not me. Everybody's kids are like that. One day, I forget how we even, this even started. Oh, I went to a, there was a, at the time, and this has also been discontinued, but it was discontinued even before STEP was discontinued. There were support groups that you could go to once a week for STEP graduates at a place called the Fortune Society, which is still there, but they don't do this anymore. Um, and she went, she came one night as a guest speaker and she said, I remembered her and she remembered me and she said, would you come address one of my classes? And I did. And, uh, and then other professors started asking me and uh, so that became pretty much a regular thing. And um, uh, she uh, was speaking at, it was winter here and she was speaking at Disneyland, Disney World in Florida, in Orlando. And she got me a gig there. My, that was my first paid speaking gig. And they flew me down to Orlando, Florida, when it was winter here. And I was laying by the pool getting sun. I really loved that. <laughs> and I addressed a, a, an audience there. It was a criminal justice conference. And from there, I got invited to another place. They invited me to another place. They invited me to another place. That, you know. 
And I was do I, I could still be doing that a lot. It, you know, so I got sick. You know, I got uh, had double hip replacements and hepatitis C and all this stuff that was really, you know. And and I, um, I moved to New Jersey. I had a TV show for a while. I had a radio show on WBAI for a while. Now nobody knows me. <laughs> now I just do this occasionally. Um, What's it like to? I mean, you know. We're, you know, we're a couple, you and I are a couple of crackheads that have some like really crazy story. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and whenever I tell my story or talk to people, everybody, you know, they, 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 you know, it's the mixture of, yeah. you know, horror and awe. Well, and I think they don't expect us to be not only bright, you know, uh, but. Uh, so candid. But, uh, yeah. And, and, and so. I think a lot of them don't expect us to be sophisticated. I mean, I'm not Miss Sophisticate, but, you know, I do put my napkin in my lap. I mean, you know, um, I, I think they always expect drug addicts, unless they've got someone in their family or they know someone, which today is most people, but there's still a, a whole big bunch of people out there who don't know anybody who's been really uh, down um, so far in their addiction. And they assume that those people are less than um, and, and stupid and, and uh, kind of uh, backwards people. And uh, when they find out that it can happen to anyone, it sort of surprises them. And I hope it gives them, I hope it, why I do this too is I hope it teaches them that if they're using drugs recreationally, if they've been doing that for 10 years and they're still just, I don't know, snorting coke on Saturday nights, which I know quite a few people I used to use with 30 years ago that are still just snorting coke on Saturday nights. Hey, good for them. They can do it. Um, there are some people who can use drugs. Like I said, I'm not one of them. But I'm hoping that the people realize that it can, it can happen to anyone. It can happen to them. It can happen to someone in their families. But more than that, I'm hoping the people that are using too much and it's hurting them and hurting their life um, know that they can stop. Because if I could do it, anybody can do it. Um, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't easy, but I know, and this is a very, a slogan, eh? uh, but some slogans are just right on. And this is, you know, um, the worst day in my life today is, is better than my best day in the street. Um, because I have choices today and, you know, I have security. I can sit with my children and, uh, even when I've made a few mistakes, uh, since then, and I don't hide it. Um, I, I don't believe in hiding. I'm not a, I'm not a liar today. I can be honest, even when I'm showing my foolishness, <laughs> you know, uh, everybody's foolish at one time or another. It's okay to be human. Um, and, and my children, like Nisa, she said it uh, many times that one of the reasons she doesn't use drugs is she's afraid. She's afraid of that what happened to me could happen to her. And it could, who knows? She told you know? And I'm, and I'm glad of that. Um, but by the same token, she also says that she advocates for decriminalization, legalization, and that prostitute, prostitution shouldn't be legal, very illegal. I mean, yeah. she has a very progressive sure. you know, a point of view. Given everything you went through, you would you would think that the children would have uh, the you know the more uh, reactionary kind of uh, you know resistance to that yeah. you know they, out of shame, and she's really embraced it. Yeah. Well, she knows that it did nothing but hurt me. Um, I I smoked cocaine sometimes without sleeping for two weeks, and. Uh, the worst that happened to me is, I, you know, I started to hallucinate, but, you know, there was always someone with me at that time because when you have that kind of money to do that kind of drugs, you're never alone, you know? Um, but the worst things that happened to me were being beaten beaten, and, and stabbed and raped. Those had nothing to do with the drugs I was using. It had to do with the other people and the fact that uh, there is so much evil out there. And this is another reason I do this. I was arrested 50 times or however many times, the, even my record doesn't show because they never spelled my name right. You know, th these are the police that we have. And they couldn't spell my name right. So I remember standing up in front of the judge and I'm going, uh, Mary Barr, AKA, my name is Mary Ellen Barracliffe. And I always told them my full name, but um, they would go, AKA Mary Barr Cliss, Mary Barr Clay, AKA this, AKA that. And I was just like, that made me sound like a criminal, all those aliases. I didn't need an alias. I wasn't hiding from anyone, you know? So um, finally, I changed my name to Mary Barr, and they spelled it right every time. And that's why I changed my name. The only reason is so the police could get it right. 
Um, <laughs> hey, and it turns out it fits better on a business card too, but in, at any rate. Well, you know, my, my kids are, uh, I had another child and when I was in the street, um, and this, this child was definitely exposed every day to drugs, born healthy, kept down his formula, slept all night, was adopted. Um, and to, I've only gotten two uh, reports from both those children that I gave up for adoption. Um, I did put my name in a database. I hope they find me, even if they hate me or are mad at me. Um, just so I can tell them how much I love them. Um, but they have, all my children have beautiful lives. But it was because, it was in spite of the system, not because of it. And um, I overcame the system, so, so other people can do that too. I want people that get out of jail to not say, oh my God, you know, my life is over, because it's not. Um, I want people to know that jail is not the answer and that, again, you should, we should be putting people in jail that we're afraid of, not people like me. And that's another thing. I, I was arrested 50 times and, and incarcerated 45, something like that. But the men that did this stuff to me, they're still out there and that's scary. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you for your courage and your beauty, really, and, and the absolutely inspiring and hopeful way that you are. Oh, because thank I, you. you know, I, I thought, you know, you always think you have it bad until you hear somebody that had it worse. Mm -hmm. and, then, and, and one more thing. I love my children, but I always love my children. Uh, drug users love their children. You know, and um, I've met one of your children. I met your daughter and we interviewed her and she loves you too. Oh, yeah. yeah. My son loves me too. She says you're a trip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I am. I'm more than, I'm a, I'm a journey. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I'm happy, and, and uh, even though all those bad things happened to me, the weird thing was is that I, I actually am more of an optimist today. I believe we're more good than we are bad, and, and that's why we still exist. Um, but it's a precarious balance, and, and to do, again, to do the positive things and to help folk instead of, of, of uh, hurting them, it, it makes sense to me to help them. You know, and, and it would save us a lot of money and a lot of grief, and um, I, a lot more people would recover faster as well. Well, thanks for helping. Thank you. <laughs>